right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Blair Lacourt, who is up the coast a little bit in Tiburon. How are you doing, Blair? I'm doing, doing great. It's not as sunny, but it's just as happy. Yeah, here. well, just, you know, just the, over the Golden Gate Bridge. Exactly. Yeah, well, I tell you, I, I lived in San Francisco, lived up in the city for a while, and uh, I couldn't believe that microclimates really existed until I lived there. <laughs> and then I realized that my street could be sunny, and I walked down a few blocks, and it's like cold and foggy. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, the Golden Gate Bridge is a classic one for that. Um, so Brian, uh, Blair is a dynamic business executive, renowned in his insatiable curiosity, collaborative spirit, and competitive drive, successfully steered companies like Lumos Technology, Exojet, and Vertical Networks from startup phases to IPOs. Uh, exception talent for engaging and motivating teams to achieve strategic and operational excellence. And kind of what we're going to talk about today really is, is the idea of of relationships and what relationships really mean in a, in a business context. And you, you've written something recently about uh, relativity rules, Blair. So can you explain what relativity rules mean? Sure. Sure. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, back to the, back to the basics. I sat down um, about a year ago when I had stepped down as a public CEO and I, I wanted to actually go back and take a minute to think about, you know, business and business as a sport, because we all know at the end of the day, your family and your friends are the things that endure and business is a privilege that we get to play. Um, and I realized that there were two things that I, I had in common in every uh, business I'd had since I was, you know, 11 years old, you know, and that was that every business had um, patterns and every business you had to deal with people. And so I started kind of diving into this idea of, you know, what is a, you know, what is a relationship in business? And uh, you may, uh, John, have, have heard of, you know, Dunbar's number, which is that uh, classic study done about 30, 40 years ago that um, they did that said, look, you can connect with about 150 people emotionally at any given time, which um, a lot of people have said, well, no, technology's changed that. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting dynamic of, you know, what is really relative to you? What is really a relationship? And that was kind of the basis of my, uh, my paper. Yeah, because we live in a, I can see why people are questioning the Dunbar's number thing now, because we live in this world where people seem to measure everything in volume. You know, it's like the amount of connections I have maybe on LinkedIn or the amount of this, the amount of that. And, and moving away from that idea of, you know, quality over quantity. But, uh, but from what you're saying is like that the behaviors might have changed, but the underlying reality of of how you how you can really develop meaningful relationships hasn't changed. Right. And, and it's really got to do with, uh, you know, with your brain chemistry. Now, Dunbar was a unique guy because he was a, um, a psychotherapist and he was an anthropologist. And you usually don't see that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And so, you know, he really looked at it um, and they did a lot of studies, you know, um, to try to uh, reinforce this. In fact, they did a study, um, you know, 10 years ago on 10 million phone users, and they looked at how many people that they interacted with. Um, and um, you, as you know, we all have these new tools. So we theoretically should be interacting mm -hmm. with more people than 150. And the reality is it's bimodal. Um, for some people, they interact with a lot more people, but they have a lot lower quality. And for a certain number of people who use technology the right way, they've actually been able to geometrically change the, the relationships they have. And, you know, just to give you um, an example on the, the far left, the one that's not as, as happy, is that in the United States today, the most recent study was that the average male only has about one friend. That's mm -hmm. how many friends they believe that they have. Now, the average female is um, three, but they define them quite, quite differently. And when you look at the fragmentation, that includes both friends and business friends. Right. Um, and the way Dunbar's number worked was he went from family to friends, to acquaintances, to connections, uh, to contacts. And in his mind, contact meant that you could walk by someone and you may not know who they are um, or what their name is, but you know that they're not dangerous and right. you've seen them before. And so 
relationships were really based on safety. And so what we're trying to overcome as we play our game of business is how do we actually not listen to the way our brain works, which is to only interact and uh, be vulnerable to people that we believe aren't dangerous. They may look like us or we've seen them before and how to actually take those chances. And that to me is the trick on how to go from 150 to 250 to 350 is your contact database is just a list. But if you use your CRM correctly, it is actually a chance for you, not mm -hmm. a guarantee, but mm -hmm. a chance for you to actually open that up and in, in essence, make you relative to someone, but also uh, make them relative to you. And mm -hmm. that's the key is you have to have both sides of the transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So explain to me a little bit about because um, you know vulnerability and that is is mentioned by a lot of people and it's a uh, it's one of those uh, it's one of those words that is you know kind of ubiquitous now. But what it, explain to me from your point of view what does that mean? Because I feel sometimes people don't understand it or they're uncomfortable with it and they're saying, well, what do you mean? Like I start being vulnerable with people I don't know or people I half know or what's going on here? Right. Like, do I need to hug them or do I need yeah, to yeah, yeah. in front of them <laughs> and then they're going to know that I'm a real human being? You know, listen, um, vulnerability itself, there's um, somewhere between, depending on what research you read, seven to nine levels of intimacy, right? Where you go and you have to actually work your way down until someone feels comfortable enough with you that not only do they know you're not going to kill them, but they feel like if they open up to you, that you will be not only empathetic, but compassionate. And this is a really interesting thing. Um, the number one correlate to human health span, not necessarily lifespan, you can be miserable and <laughs> walk your way through, mm -hmm. but actually for your immune system to be healthy, the number one correlate is not food, it's not exercise, it's not sleep, and it's not the ex exosome, which means, you know, are you living in a place that's um, healthy or not? It turns out it's the ability to have a dyadic relationship with at least one person mm -hmm. at any given time. And dyadic relationship means that someone empathizes with you, but you actually believe, you believe that if you were in trouble, they would either say something or do something to help you. Right. That one belief in your mind actually changes your immune system to be healthier mm -hmm. and actually protects your body. Wow. And I would argue that that same what we'll call in the military, we used to call a force multiplier, that right. it multiplies everything that you do. That same connection actually makes business relationships more enjoyable and more productive, because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, people want to do business with people that deep down subconsciously, they believe they're building something. Yeah. That doesn't mean you'll always do what they want or give them the price they want, but they believe that you're a good enough person that if they really told you my boss is going to fire me, I screwed up, you may care. Yeah, and it, it sounds too simple, but I can tell you the research is undeniable in health. And a lot of the research that's happening now in business is proving out the same concept, mm -hmm. that getting to that point, um, which requires you to take a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting, a really interesting concept. I used to always view the measurement of, uh, of, of that friend or, or that person being, if you call them at 4 a.m. in the morning from the freeway and would they get out of bed and come and collect you? I always put that, that's the measure. If the answer, you know, yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, that's our, our uh, you know, our male driven definition, yeah. which is I'm screwed. I need help. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Now, if they called you at uh, three in the morning because they were drunk and they wanted to talk about their, you know, the date that they didn't get that <laughs> night, then the issue would be boundaries. And yeah. we set a boundary. I love you, but I'm going to hang up on you because yeah. I can't talk to you. And so it's not ubiquitous. I mean, calling yeah, at three in the morning, if you're really in trouble, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's where you want compassion. Yeah, for sure. So then how, how do you parlay this then, as you were just mentioning there, parlay this into business relationships? Uh, because I do think that, uh, you know, people's antennas are up a lot these days, you know, particularly because, you know, we're in the in the in the era of AI and all this kind of stuff. And just in general, people are like, oh, I don't know what I can trust anymore. So how do you parlay that into business relationships? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent point, John, because even if you have a piece of technology and say it's not just your contact database, say it's a CRM and say mm -hmm. it's got a lot of information in it, the first response that people have is, oh, it's my birthday, but it's in his 
list to call me to, <laughs> right? And so that's not effective. It doesn't feel real. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like you're that you care. So that the issue is, I think, um, as I just had a discussion with one of my sons the other day, I said, look, the only way to have a real partnership is that both people have to get something out of it. Yeah. But you don't know what they need at any mm -hmm. given time. So what you really have to be able to do is not just try to build a relationship of what you need or what you think would make them happy. You have to ask a few questions. Now, if you know, like with me, the number one thing that would make me happy is if you saw something that you know my son loves this and you're going to do it. I know that you're actually doing that for mm -hmm. me because you know me. It's not that you're just calling for my birthday. My dad used to have an old saying that said, you know, the work, you know, the, the most impactful thing to do is to write someone a note or send them a card when it's not their birthday. And I said, well, mm -hmm. why? It's random. He yeah. said, that's the point. If you wrote them a card when it's not their birthday, they know that you were thinking about them, not because you felt compelled that it was their birthday. And it's the right thing to do. We were good mm -hmm. people, but that you actually thought about them and it made that uh, that that trigger happened in your brain that you wanted to write them a note. So it's not only that you did it and then you wrote something personal and that's kind of hard to fake. Yeah. No, I, I, you're, you're hundred percent. I think that's hard to fake. And I think that's why the people need to understand that if you want to come across as authentic and genuine and all that, you have to put a little bit of work into it, right? It's not, it's not something that you can just, as we said, you can just outsource or your automate or whatever you have to put, you have to put some of yourself into it. Otherwise it's never going to come off as authentic. Right. And, and if you don't know who they really are, yeah. you know, look, I'm come from a big Italian family and we're always joking around and making fun of each other. Right. And to us, that's that's love language. Right. right. You know, you're giving someone a hard time and you would never give someone a hard time that you didn't love. Right. Mm, yep. I'm sure in Ireland, that's the you know, you, yeah. you, you, you can, you know, on, a, on another you level. level. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and we all and we always hug. Yeah. Right. But if you don't understand, this is also, you know, a challenge between men and women. If you don't understand where someone's coming from, then what you may think is the right language to show connection is, is not the right language. And mm -hmm. I think that we don't ask enough questions of our mm -hmm. clients. We keep trying to actually, you know, give them the information they wanted and we ask them about the product, but we don't ask them about their job or what they're doing or where they came from, or why they're in the job that they have, or why mm. they live where they are. Because if you start to understand that, you may understand um, a lot more about what makes them happy, because it's not always about getting the best price. Sometimes it's about the fact that, um, you know, I, you know, go away with my, my kids on this thing. And in those cases, I may need you to do something early. Mm. And you know yeah. that about them, and you're okay with that. And it's, you know, but again, that's to me, we talked a little bit before about what's vulnerability is you're doing something that's not necessarily standard, right? right? And so you're taking a chance. But, you know, if you don't take a chance, you don't actually get to get to grow the relationship. Cognitive dissonance happens because it's painful. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's OK to, to fail that even failing actually makes you can make you closer. To some people, you know, I would always say. If I fail with a customer, that's my best chance to build a lifetime relationship. Yeah, yeah. Because what am I going to do next? It is is really how they're going to remember me. Yeah, a hundred percent. And one thing you just mentioned there, I just wanted to come back on, and that's the idea of sometimes when we get into selling situations, we start to think of we think of the okay. So I'm selling to you, Blair. Maybe some other people in your company, maybe your committee. But I'm I'm looking at it that I'm selling to your company and. I'm all interested in that, but I kind of forget that Blair's got skin in the game here too, because I don't, because as you mentioned, I don't know how this impacts your role in the organization. I don't know. I often think that a B2B purchase can be career enhancing. It can be career limiting, depending on how it turns out. Uh, so there's emotion wrapped up in it too. But if I don't understand what it means to you personally, rather, rather I just understand what it means to you professionally or the company, I'm missing a huge piece. Right. And, and that, again, takes a few questions. Like I just yeah. had one of my good friends come in and he said, look, I got I have this software program and I, I this is awesome. If you look at what it does, I can bring it to one of these companies who already sells to these companies. And I can say to them, sell this through your independent reps. You're going to make an extra 50 million dollars because this is awesome. Mm -hmm. I already tested it out with the end users and I 
I, I can tell you that they they like this thing. And I said, that's great. Now we know that you have something that has value to the end user. But the next question to ask is, what are the negative implications to the partnership guy you're going to talk to? Well, first, he's got to actually take this on and he's probably pretty busy. Right. So maybe he may be too busy and think, oh, my God, I just can't do it. Or maybe he doesn't have control over his independent reps and he's going to think they're yeah. going to push back and I'm going to lose credibility with them because I can't actually prove to them they're going to make money on it until they make money on it. Or mm -hmm. maybe I don't I can't do the training. I don't have resources to do the training. So this is an awesome thing. And but I can't do it. And so to your point, if you're not thinking through what they're thinking as a person, it may be that they agree with you completely, but they're just thinking, I'm you don't get it. I, mm -hmm. I can't do this. I don't have the power to do it. I don't have the resources to do it. And, you know, stop pressuring me. So <laughs> again, then you have to ask them a question, tell me what's stopping and you know, mm -hmm. you do this and be honest with me. And then you yeah. start to learn those things. Yeah. And, and I think, I think part of the problem is that, as you said, I mean, it's about asking, uh, asking good questions, but it's also the art of active listening. And that's something that a lot of people have lost uh, because we're so used to just kind of taking in sound bites or we're so used to kind of multitasking um, that we're not, that not only are we not asking really good questions sometimes, but we're not actively listening and really trying to understand the answer and drilling down a little more. Yeah, and, and or listening and understanding that they do not look at the world exactly yeah. the way we do. I mean, I love to use, you know, I bring in my dad every day because he's passed away and I, you know, he's alive as long as I sure. I remember him. But, you know, another, you know, great thing that he said is, you know, he said, listen, you, you use the, uh, you know, um, unreasonable man theory. If you're saying something to someone and it makes perfect sense to you and they're not responding to you saying you should buy this thing because yeah. look at all these reasons then one of two things is true. One is they're in a really bad mood or they're crazy. The other is maybe they're looking at it differently. And until you can see it through their lens, it's very difficult for you to understand, which means stop for a second and say either they're crazy or let's let's start over again because I'm not mm -hmm. getting the reaction I want um, and, and figure it out. And then when, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to make every sale. You have to, yeah. you know, maintain the relationship. And if it's, you know, it's not going to work, come back with something else. Yeah. And, and what you just outlined there is a great opportunity as well, as you said, to show that kind of humility or vulnerability or whatever, where you could just say like, Blair, I don't feel like I really explained this to you properly. I mean, I feel like maybe I'm all, maybe we need to come back and I need to understand a little more about where you're coming from so I can position this a little differently. Yeah. And then there's also that whole point of risk reversal. I mean, mm -hmm. to your point, we all kind of have this thing wall we put up and say, OK, they're after me. I, I know they, they want what they want me to do. I don't want to do that. And, you know, how do you reverse that risk for them? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and is it, you know, that you basically pull back? Is it that you say, hey, listen, I'm I'm happy to let you try this for free. There, there's always, you know, an opportunity to try to reverse if they're feeling risk then mm -hmm. you reverse it. In, in the example of my friend, I said, why don't you also, when you go to offer them this product, um, why don't you offer for a little bit more of the margin that you'll train all the people so right. that there, there isn't a risk to it. That And it, by the way, anyone who signs up for it, you're a hero. Anyone mm -hmm. who doesn't sign up for it, I put in the time and you didn't. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's going to work or not work, but that's an example of thinking, how can I reverse the risk? If it's really that, doesn't have the time to do this, could I take the time to do this and yeah. make it easier? And I think that's a real, and I think that's a super important point that you just uh, talked about there about uh, the de-risking. Because let's face it, when we, when we're in an economy and in a situation like we are today, the uh, a lot of sellers will come up against this no decision, right? I mean, that that tends to be often your biggest competitor because people are leery about making choices because they're like, oh, it's a market, maybe I'll just stick with what I have, or I'll just suffer through until things change. So it is it is really up to you to de-risk the situation because that there all those risks are going to be uh, front and center. Yeah. And, you know, again, everything at the end of the day about being human has to do with how we feel as mm -hmm. much as we want to believe it's all about logic. It's always wrapped in in some kind of feeling. And the more you know about someone, it may just be that, you know, they got yelled at that this morning mm -hmm. and they just don't want to think about something hard. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're not, you know, you're not going to know. So, I mean, that's back to, you know, the, the question you asked, how are you relevant on that given day to another person? And it mm -hmm. may be you're better relevant as just a friend for someone to talk to yep. that you actually will come back later and do the sale. You just have to decide, you know, what is, you know, what is the relevancy because that's what will get action to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Blair, this was fantastic. And all of Blair's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Sure. You know, I, you know, have been described, I think, as a, as a serial entrepreneur because I've been in so many businesses. But in reality, I'm someone who's both their parents were entrepreneurs and I was a support system. And I, um, you know, I love businesses where I can find an entrepreneur to help them. And that's where I invest is in small entrepreneurial businesses. And I love, uh, I've always loved coaching, you know, for 15 years, I've been a, a, a sports coach. And now I, now that I have time, I'm, you know, out speaking to people's teams and coaching. So whenever I can help, that makes me happy. That's the relevancy to me. And, uh, you know, if I can help people win, you know, that's what being a coach is all about. Yeah, fantastic. Well, again, listen, thanks, Blair. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you. <laughs>